Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. This is a true story from my past, an experience that has stayed with me for over 20 years. As someone who loves backpacking and has explored remote areas in the Western states, encountering various wildlife, including grizzly bears, I had never encountered anything as strange as what happened on this particular occasion. It was late summer, 1989, a Friday evening after work. I decided to venture out alone, accompanied by my dogs. My destination was White Rock Lake in Tahoe National Forest, a place I had never been to before. The challenge was finding the lake since the roads were unmarked. According to the topography map, I could reach it via a four-wheel drive road. I found myself driving slowly on rough, rocky dirt roads, trying to figure out my location. The roads seemed to fade away or intersect with other four-wheel drive paths leaving me disoriented. I was in the middle of nowhere, with no lakes, significant creeks, or clear destinations in sight for miles. Deciding to wait until daylight to avoid further confusion in the darkness, I pulled my four-wheel drive pickup off the road, although I probably didn't need to, since I hadn't seen anyone or anything. I parked a few yards away from the rocky road, hidden by the surrounding trees. I grabbed my sleeping bag and laid it out in front of my truck, settling down with my dog under the starry night sky. Sometime in the early morning, around 3 or 4 a.m., while it was still pitch black, I woke up to the sound of something walking towards me on the road. It was a heavy, steady footfall, clearly bipedal in nature. At first, I assumed it might be another backpacker, given the rhythm of the steps. But then, I questioned why someone would be out here on this road in the middle of the night, without light, surrounded by miles of dense forest. Although I knew it wasn't a bear, I had encountered many bears in the wild. I couldn't identify what it could be. Nonetheless, I still thought a backpacker was the most reasonable explanation. As the sound grew closer, I pondered whether I should say something, but I didn't want to startle anyone unnecessarily. I convinced myself that the passerby would simply continue on without noticing me. However, 
my growing nervousness was unusual, as there aren't many things in the wilderness that make me feel that way. Strangely, my dogs remained silent and motionless, which added to the suspense. Typically, they would have at least barked as a warning. This heavy, bipedal entity continued approaching, getting closer to the spot where I'd parked my truck off the road. I lay there, holding my breath. I didn't know what to expect and hoped it would pass by without even realizing I was there. The darkness obscured my vision completely. As it drew nearer, I could sense its size, as the rhythm of its footsteps indicated a significant presence. In my nervousness, I remained utterly silent. At that moment, a thought of encountering a Sasquatch didn't cross my mind. I had never given much thought to such things, especially in the Sierras, but that was about to change. The entity reached the point where my truck was parked off the road, and suddenly, silent, it stopped. Although I couldn't see it in the darkness, it stood only a few yards away from where I lay in my sleeping bag. I'm not sure if I made a sound, or if one of my dogs did, but something triggered a reaction from it. The entity emitted the most horrifying, piercing scream imaginable, a scream that defies description. It had lungs like nothing I'd ever encountered before. Then, still screaming, it turned around and ran back down the hill into the darkness at an astonishing speed. It continued to scream, the sound echoing through the forest without ceasing. I could hear the screams fading into the distance. I lay there in complete shock, unable to believe what had just transpired. Eventually, I snapped out of it and quickly gathered my belongings, tossing them into my truck. My dogs were equally disturbed by the experience. I assumed the entity had moved far away by then, so before leaving the area, I drove down the road with my brights on, attempting to find any footprints or signs of something unusual. My adrenaline was pumping. Although I didn't actually step out of the truck, I opened the door and peered down, hoping to spot footprints or any clue about what I had encountered. The road was too rocky to show any prints. I then let my dogs out, hoping they might pick up a scent, although I didn't know what I would do if they did. But, strangely, they immediately jumped back into the truck. This was out of character for them. I tried once more, but they insisted on staying inside. Realizing they were as unnerved as I was, I knew it was time to get out of there. I drove several miles back toward the main road, my adrenaline still surging. Before this experience, I hadn't given much thought to Sasquatch. But now, I'm definitely a believer. People try to explain it away, but I know what I heard. I didn't see anything, nor did I detect any unusual odor. But it was so close that I could feel its presence, and when it screamed, it was so close that I'm surprised I didn't feel the spit from its mouth. Nothing in those forests could scream like that or run that fast, especially nothing walking upright. I don't dwell on the subject of Sasquatch, nor have I made it my mission to search for them, but I know they exist. My experience is still vivid in my mind. Whether or not others believe, it is irrelevant to me. I'm not sharing this account to convince anyone. I'm simply sharing an experience I had one night in the Sierra near Truckee. On to the next one. Hi, my name is Andy. I'm a 19-year-old college student. 
and the story I'm about to tell you happened three years ago. I lived in the city at the time, but I grew up in the country. So, whenever I went back, I tried to enjoy it as much as possible. What I'm about to tell you happened to me during the summer when I was visiting my grandparents. In those days, I loved to walk in the woods with my headphones and listen to podcasts all day. I was a big fan of Joe Rogan at the time. I would just walk around listening to my podcasts and watching the nature around me. One day, I found a very pretty river with a nice patch of grass on the bank. I found the shade particularly pleasant, and since the weather was very mild, I laid down in the grass with my hands behind my head, closed my eyes, and quietly listened to my podcast. I'd put my backpack down on the ground a few feet beside me, and after a while, I heard something rustling around me. I opened my eyes weakly, without moving any muscle, and that's when I saw it a small creature searching my backpack. It was no more than three feet tall, and it had the skin of a snake in a way. It had huge eyes and very large ears like a bat. The creature was quite small. It didn't seem particularly dangerous to me. The creature, I like to think of it as a kind of goblin, continued to search my back and took out a small bottle of water it brooded slightly, looked around, and when our gaze was about to cross, I closed my eyes again. With my eyes still closed, I heard it leave. After a few minutes, I opened my eyes again and looked around. There was no sign of any creature, but the water bottle was gone. I'm sure people will say that I was asleep, but I swear I wasn't. I don't really know what else to say about my story. I never saw the goblin again. I'm sure you're used to hearing incredible stories, and mine must seem quite lame in comparison, but you know, I think there's room in all your stories for one like mine. A story not with a hostile creature, but with just a little water thief goblin. Take care. On to the next one. In Robertson County in Tennessee, my brother and I were on our family farm playing in the woods as usual. We were in a heavily wooded area with thick underbrush in a valley behind our tobacco barn playing in the stream that ran along one side of the barn. We were collecting rocks and making a dam for a swimming hole for the next summer's youth. It was late in the afternoon, almost dusk. I kept having one of those gut feelings that something wasn't right, but I couldn't put my finger on it, so we kept working. I had mentioned my feelings to my brother. I crossed the stream with a jump, holding a large field rock and heard a stick breaking loudly. I looked under my feet and there was nothing but leaves and mud. I looked back across the stream at my brother who wasn't near any dead falls. I also had a severe wake-up call in my gut to get out of there. I placed my rock and told my brother we had to get out of there immediately. Something wasn't right. He didn't protest, as his hackles were also raised by that point. I retrieved my rifle from the tree across the creek where we'd left our weapon. A pump BB air rifle. We didn't get shotgun till next Christmas. And walked to the four-foot woven wire fence we had to cross. I set my BB gun down on the other side of the fence and grabbed some low-hanging tree limbs to assist my getting across the fence. Once I dropped down on the other side, I turned toward the barn to pick up my BB gun. I came eye to eye with a thing. A huge, black, hairy thing crouched down slightly behind an old tree. It had huge black eyes and, needless to say, scared the bejesus out of me. I screamed my brother's name at the top of my lungs and started pumping my BB gun for all it was worth. I intended to shoot it in the eyes if it moved. My brother was about 15 yards from me on the other side of the fence retrieving his BB gun. 
My next thought was to run for help, so I took off for the clearing some 50 yards away. My brother says he looked at me after I screamed, a blood-curdling scream, he says, and says I was literally as white as a sheet and thought, what the heck's wrong with her? He then fired his BB air gun because it was a long pistol type model that he stuck through his belt. Then he said he looked up across the creek and saw the thing. Only it was out from behind the tree, standing fully erect now. My brother cleared a four foot fence in one bound with two pair of long underwear and a pair of jeans on and he wasn't much taller than the fence at the time. Meanwhile, I'd made it to the clearing and turned toward the woods with my gun ready, looking for any sign of my brother. I was never so glad in my life to see a hunter's orange sock cap bobbing my way. I was crying and screaming for him hysterically. He ran up to me and said he'd heard it chasing him, but it didn't follow him out of the woods yet anyway. We ran the whole rest of the way back to the farmhouse, which was about a quarter of a mile across the main road. When we reached the house and fell in the door, as my aunt says, we told her and my cousin about our encounter. They laughed it off nervously, and my aunt then confessed to many sightings and strange occurrences through the years in the area. She told us a man had disappeared off a bridge on a tractor just below, less than 500 yards downstream where we'd been when she was a child. She said the tractor was found overturned in the creek, but the man never was. On to the next one. In Todd County in Minnesota, I was home from college for a weekend in the spring with my best friend and since we were looking for a little cash to earn, my parents hired us to clean out the garage of boxes, paper, etc. We decided to get my dad's tractor and hook the wagon up to it, throw the garbage in, and haul it to a burning pile we used to burn brush. And now the contents of the garage. This burn pile is about 200 to 250 yards from the house next to the woods that my parents owned. Next to the woods, has always been a farm field, usually grown with alfalfa and around 150 acres. Leading up to the brush pile is long, tall grass with sparse trees here and there with an old barn and an old house nearby, both abandoned. We worked through the afternoon cleaning the garage, getting a sizable load on the wagon until it was overflowing. We decided to finally go down to the pile dump off what we had and leave the remaining garbage for another trip once we got the fire going. It was beginning to get dark as my friend and I took the tractor and wagon to the pile, unloaded it, and started a very big fire with my parents' permission. Both of us stayed and unloaded the entire trailer and made sure it wasn't going anywhere. I vividly remember that it was dead calm that evening. I asked my friend if he thought one of us should go get the remaining garbage, which was agreed upon, and somehow I was the one to go back with the tractor while he stayed back to tend the fire. I suppose I was gone at most 20 minutes to half an hour and returned. I shut off the tractor and threw a few things on the fire and decided to take a break. As I was standing there next to my friend, I didn't give it much thought, but he was very quiet and seemed almost serious. Suddenly, I heard a sound like someone or something was running around the perimeter of the fire, just far enough out of the light of the fire to see any movement. I looked at my friend and said something like, Did you just hear that? He replied, Since you left, I have been hearing very strange noises all around me, and I've been standing as close to the fire as possible. I could see that he was visibly shaking and had definite fear in his eyes. That is when the trees started breaking in the woods. I'm not talking about a twig breaking. It sounded like limbs from the trees were being torn out of the trunks 
and becoming more and more frequent and increasing in size. At that point, we began hearing the running again. This time, it was multiple things running at the speed that no human could run. At least myself and I was an athlete then. They were heavy sounding. We both looked at each other and didn't want to be there anymore. Firewatch or no firewatch. We decided that the only thing to do at this point just to feel safe was throw more boxes and stuff on the fire to just keep whatever was messing with us at bay. As we were throwing garbage on the fire, I happened to look up beyond the fire and saw this dark, black figure deftly moving along the perimeter of the woods and suddenly duck back into the woods. At most, a hundred yards away, I said, forget it. Get on the tractor. We're getting out of here. I started the tractor and my friend instinctively grabbed the pitchfork with us, jumped on the wagon, and basically guarded us if something was to attack, which didn't happen. We didn't go back that night. I did return the following morning to make sure the fire was out, which it was. I also went into the woods to see if I could find any track, but there were so many leaves that I found nothing. The fields, too, had growth on them and were hard packed. I purchased the land about eight years ago from my mom and spent a lot of time up there cutting wood and playing around with my kids, friends, and relatives. And every time I drive by the perimeter of the woods, I think to myself, from the distance, that figure had to be seven to eight feet tall, maybe taller and quick. My friend and I are still best friends and do a lot together. And when we're alone, we talk about that event occasionally. And both of us still get a little rattled about that evening because we still feel like we were intentionally chased out of there, possibly because of the fire, warmth, abandoned buildings to nest in. We still ponder those variables. When this happened, it was so weird that I can't explain. These beings were like goblins. They intentionally did things by making us think that there isn't something ordinary about this evening. They didn't need to attack us to get us to leave, just break some branches and run around us. However, this was enough to paralyze us with fear. Let's be honest, when night falls, Humans are severely limited in our faculties. We can't see in the dark, are dependent on light, and really cannot function in any remote behavior like these beings. It was about 9 p.m. I wish I knew what to look for, but I looked for branches snapped off trees in the spring after winter. There is brush and branches everywhere, so I thought something like this was looking for a needle in a haystack. I didn't realize these beings can literally twist a small tree trunk, though so that may have been the case as I have learned that recently. There is a woods that fills close to a section nearly 600 plus acres. There is a 125 acre lake which feeds a small stream which leads through my property as well as a diverse array of hardwood forests, willow scrub, meadows, farm fields, and cattail swamp with the city of Long Prairie very close. On to the next one. In Chemung County in New York, the trail I was jogging on was at the base of one of the hills that surrounds the Chemung Valley. The trail itself was approximately one quarter of a mile long, fairly clear, about two feet wide, and surrounded by woods on both sides. The trail itself, as well as the hill, is located in the outskirt of the city proper, actually the town of Elmira versus city of Elmira. As it was very cold that evening, the snow was ice-crusted, and it was very easy to discern footsteps in the woods. There are a number of trails that diverge from this one that lead up and over the hill. The hill is probably 120 to 200 feet tall with a gentle slope. A good number of roads are in this area as it is residential. The most notable would be Route 352. This incident occurred in late February at approximately 10 p.m. 
The conditions that night were very clear and cold, with a fairly decent amount of moonlight. As I recall, there was about four inches of old snow on the ground, and as it was very cold that evening, the snow was ice-encrusted and made a good deal of noise when stepped on. I was jogging on a trail that is approximately one quarter of a mile long. The trail itself was fairly clear, about two feet wide, and ran across the base of one of the hills that surrounds the Chiming Valley. The surrounding area was heavily forested with a mix of trees common to upstate New York. The incident itself occurred when I was approximately halfway through the trail. At that point, the canopies of trees was very thick, and as I was running, I heard the distinct sound of footsteps about 20 or so feet into the tree line off to my right. Being slightly startled, I picked up my pace, but at that point believed that it was a deer in the wood. The trail itself is a common deer path. Although startled, I figured I had spooked a deer and expected to hear the deer receding into the wood in the opposite direction. Instead, I heard the footsteps move parallel to the direction in which I was running. This immediately sent a streak of fear through me, as I have lived in upstate New York all of my life, and knew very well that a deer would bolt in the opposite direction of startled. I ran faster, and as I did, so did the footsteps in the woods quicken. Thinking that I may be hearing nothing than the echo of my own footfalls, I stopped dead in my tracks to test my theory. When I did, so did the steps continued for another two or three seconds, stopping slightly ahead of me and to my right. I stayed where I was for another ten seconds or so, trying to discern what the sound might mean, and while I waited there, I could clearly hear what sounded like a slight side-to-side -side movement off in the wood, as if someone was stepping from one foot to another, as if anxious. I attempted to see into the tree line, but could not see that far into the wood clearly. After about ten seconds or so, I began to jog again, and tried to convince myself I was just hearing things and was spooking myself. When I had gone about five feet, the footsteps began again. It was very clear to me that the sounds were coming from a biped as the footfalls sounded like that of a person versus a deer or a dog. What spooked me was that for every two to three steps I was taking, the individual, for a lack of better term, in the wood was taking one. I'm six feet four inches tall, and at that time I was taking the longest strides I could. The thought that kept racing through my mind at the time was that it was either someone having fun with me, this thought was dispelled by the apparent giant strides I heard, or that I was alone in the woods with a psychopath with very long legs, no joke. The most unsettling element at the time was the fact that I'm over six feet tall, and at the time weighed in excess of 250 pounds, mostly muscle. So I figured that whoever it was was not intimidated by my physical presence. I made record speed through the trail and exited onto a service road next to the local golf course. At this point, I ran another 10 feet or so into a clearing at the edge of the trail and stopped to look back into the woods. I continued to hear the footfalls until they stopped at the edge of the tree line. At that point, I was standing under a fluorescent light and, as such, lost any night vision I had acquired. Consequently, I could not identify any shape or form in the wood. I did clearly hear what sounded to be heavy breathing and a light throaty rumble. My initial thought was that it sounded like someone with a respiratory condition sitting in the tree line. I then heard a tree branch snap. And at this point, I turned and ran at breakneck speed across the golf course, looking back over my shoulder every 10 feet or so. At one point, I tripped and remember thinking that tripping like that only occurred in the movies. A few minutes later, I exited the golf course onto one of the main streets in the town of Elmira 
and have not used that trail at night ever since. At the time of the incident, I did feel extremely scared, but in retrospect, I feel like there was no real threat in the incident. Whoever or whatever was in the woods that night could have clearly done me harm if they so wished, but the entire time, whatever it was, stayed twenty or so feet off to my right. I have not given this incident a great deal of thought since the occurrence until I was reviewing Bigfoot encounters online and found sightings of Bigfoot in an area not too distant from my experience. I asked a friend of mine who lives in the area of sightings and what he knew about Bigfoot, and he indicated that for years people have stated that they have seen Bigfoot in the woods about 15 miles from where I was. I do not know if this was a Bigfoot, but something was in the woods with me that night, and from the sounds it made, it was too large to be a person, and it definitely wasn't bipedal. The incident occurred at approximately 10 p.m. at night. I was jogging through a trail at the base of one of the hills in our valley. The area was mixed forest common to upstate New York. It was late February, cold and with about four inches of old snow on the ground. The night was cloudless and clear, and there was a fairly decent amount of light between the moonlight and its reflection off the snow. As noted previously, I was on a trail that cut through the woods at the base of the hill. The trail is approximately a quarter of a mile long and ends at the local golf course. The surrounding area is a mix of tree line, pine, maple, etc., common to upstate New York. The trail itself is a common path for deer, which I had initially thought was following me. The entrance to the trail is at the end of a dead-end street in a residential area, although there is no heavy traffic from humans, cars, in the area at the time of year. There are a number of ponds within a tenth of a mile or so from the trail on the golf course. There is one documented sighting that occurred in Alpine Junction, about 15 to 20 miles from where I was that night. Also, in asking around, I learned that the area of Alpine Junction has a local history of Bigfoot sightings. On to the next one. A 12-year-old boy was working at a construction site off a dirt road for his father. His dad and uncles were building a house for Ricky Sweeney. His two uncles, Ricky and Jimmy, took the work truck to a small country store to get a mid-morning snack for the crew. On the way back to the work site, they drove down a dirt road lined with thick, overhanging trees. After a quarter of a mile from the left appeared a creature that was over seven and a half feet tall. It was a slender animal with dark fur head to toe, which ran into the middle of the road as his uncle slammed on the brakes. It was bipedal and 50 feet away. It had extremely large eyes and the nose was flatter than a human nose. The hair coat was dark brown to black and the hair was long with most of it appearing to be six inches or longer. The hands were very large and the large fingers were articulated. All three of them started screaming and Uncle Ricky was trying to get the truck into reverse gear. The animal had what appeared to be like pieces of clothing under one arm and dragging on the road. The animal then broke itself out of its fright and bounded off north to the right side of the road, across the road, and jumping a four and a half foot high fence with ease quickly disappearing up a hill. On to the next one. Near Short Mountain in Warren County in Tennessee, two witnesses, a brother and sister, were sitting on their back patio when they saw what appeared to be a bipedal, light gray colored creature that appeared to have a head shaped like a feline. It walked out slowly out of the tree line toward a pond, and upon reaching the pond, the creature bent over and drank. They both noticed that it had large canine that were visible even from a distance of about 100 yards. The creature then stood up and walked back the same way it had come from. 
on to the next one. I, my wife, and two sons were living on a remote farm in Hawkins County, Tennessee. One night around 11 p.m., directly behind the house, screaming started. It was like the combination of a woman, a large cat, and a mule. It took place in a cedar thicket up on a hill. I ran outside on the porch to see what was going on. I could also hear the sound of trees cracking or thrashing. The screaming kept up for approximately one and a half hours. The house itself sat on a bench, surrounded by ridges or in a bowl, so to speak. Whatever was making the screams and growls did so while circling the house on the ridge. After standing on the porch for a few minutes, the whole time my wife was begging me to come back in. I went back in the house. All I had was a single 20-gauge shotgun which I loaded. We both sat there scared to death. We had no phone and the nearest neighbor lived half a mile away down a four-wheel drive road which was treacherous in daylight. Off and on, I also heard the sound of rocks being hit together. It was 11 p.m. and overcast. On to the next one. This is northeast of the Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge Duck River Unit. I was turkey hunting with a friend of mine on some land on the banks of the Duck River. I have heard no reports of Bigfoot in the area, nor seen or heard any signs of Bigfoot around there, so this is probably nothing, but this is what happened. There are a few houses in the area. There are many small valleys, dense hardwood forests, and a lot of cropland planted mainly with soybeans or wheat. It was a good place for turkey hunting. I saw 20 or 30 a day before the season opened. I was about two miles deep in the woods from the road where my truck was parked. It was getting dark fast, so I started walking back to the truck on a dirt road. It got so dark that I could not see 10 feet in front of me. Shortly after I started walking down the road, something started walking in the woods near me. It sounded like it was about 100 feet away. I could not see it at all. I smelled no strange smells either. Whatever it was kept constant pace with me. At first, I thought that it might be a deer because I knew there were no bears in that area. I wasn't worried about whatever it was at first because it was not coming any closer. It was just keeping pace. I still thought it was probably a deer until I heard it step on a fallen tree. When it stepped on the tree, the tree snapped in two. It sounded like a rather large tree also. I know this because I lived on a farm for most of my life and we would clear land with a bulldozer and tractors so I knew what different sized trees sounded like when they snap in two. When I heard that tree break, that got my attention because whatever broke it was extremely heavy. I got a little scared too because all I had was a shotgun. I decided to see if it would keep up with me if I ran, so I ran for about 100 yards and it kept up but got no closer. I stopped running though because it was so dark I was afraid I would trip or hit a tree. This thing followed me for about 10 minutes and when I started getting close to the road, it stayed further following completely. We slept in the truck all night so we could hunt the next day, but we heard no screams or strange noises as reported by many people, so I have no idea what it was. The closest Bigfoot reports I have seen are from counties north and northeast of here, small valleys. Hardwood forests cover most of the area, but there are some fields planted with crops such as soybean and a few small cow pastures. The Duck River runs through the area. The forests in the Tennessee National Wildlife Refuge are more dense. The Tennessee River also runs through the refuge. There are a few houses. There are many small dirt roads, probably made by logging companies. On to the next one. 
on a slough bank in the Mississippi River bottom. This was near Drummond in Tipton County in Tennessee. A friend and I were using a wounded rabbit call to call up coyotes. We were sitting in a field about an acre. The thing came up and sounded like it started to bellyache. I figured because we were in the field. I have been inside the lion's house at feeding time and those lions didn't have anything on this thing. We never saw it as it wouldn't step out into the light, but it cried about 12 to 15 times. When it stopped, I really worried where it was and what it was. I left and didn't go back for about two weeks. It was at night time. On to the next one. Clackamas. Willamette Falls is in the middle of the Willamette River, located on the very edge of Portland city limits across from what is now known as Oregon City in Oregon. The village mentioned in this section on the east side, not west of the Willamette River, may have been home to the Clackamas tribe. If not this tribe, it then could have been the Kalapuya, Tulatin, and or Willamette tribe, as well as the Multnomah, which had all used the same location to catch fish trapped by the falls. In a story from the Quarterly of the Oregon Historical Society in an article written by H. S. Lyman titled Reminiscence of Louis Labonte is a story titled The Skookum and the Wonderful Boy. It is probably the oldest legend or story of bullies being defeated. This story starts with a successful First Nation fishing village at Willamette Falls on the opposite side of the Willamette River in what is now considered to be Oregon City on the very edge of Portland or city limits. Now, there is a museum of Oregon Territory near the same location, which has several artifacts on display, which also corroborates much of both stories from the same Oregon Historical Society article. How can that be? This museum also has a stone head on display, which also bears a similar likeness to other stone heads held on display at the Mary Hill Museum in Goldendale, Washington. Yet, as the First Nation success at the falls continued, the story mentions the Skookum, a seemingly derogatory name for the creature, as the story then describes the following detail. But from the mountains on the east, there came a frightful Skookum who destroyed the entire village and even the old chieftain and all people except the chief's wife and her unborn son. The boy's mother then raises her son to become big and strong. The boy grows up and, as the story of the legend then notes, taking the tomahawk in his hand, the boy went out to look abroad, but was almost immediately met by the skookum returning. Thereupon, driving his tomahawk into a gnarly log of wood so as to make a crack, he cried out to the giant, if you are so strong, hold this crack open while I take another stroke. And into the opening, the witless skookum placed his finger. But the tomahawk being instantly withdrawn and the crack closing was held fast, after which he was easily killed by the boy. This story gives us another tribal reference to a giant, which is referred to as being described as so strong. This is, once again, descriptive of Bigfoot Sasquatch. The Chinook word skookum also means strong. This story brings about yet another translation of these creatures being described as foolish and very easy to fool, and also the very real idea and reverence that we may be immediately met by just such giants in the very woods right outside our own homes. Choctaw. Their historic range consisted of areas of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. They were later displaced to reservation areas in Oklahoma and Mississippi during the 1800s. Some traditional Choctaw names for the creatures are as follows. Cash Ito Apollo, meaning cannibal man, Nalusa Falea, meaning big giant, and Shampi, 
which is described as a giant monster in an article titled The Giant Monster, written by Kyle Thompson. There are some more details on the Choctaw lore associated with these creatures known as Shampi. As noted, the Shampi prefer the darkest reaches of the wilderness, where nobody has ever found their cave. They cannot stand the brightness of the sun and prefer the impenetrable darkness where they are seldom seen. The Shampi are described to have a very keen sense of smell and can smell blood for quite a while. These observations are also still sometimes noted in modern sightings. The Shampi are also known among the Choctaw to follow a man while he is out hunting, especially if he has had contact with blood from some other animals he has killed, or if the hunter is carrying back game meat which he has killed. Today, these same observations of Bigfoot, Sasquatch by people who are out hunting is still noted in similar detail and under similar circumstances. Mysterious, a Choctaw medicine woman during an interview on Mysterious America says that these creatures can remain invisible during daylight hours through a process of wrapping the light around themselves. Caddo they at one time lived in the bordering regions of Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. Today, most of them reside on reservation land in Oklahoma. In and around the land of the legend of Boggy Creek, the documentary movie of a Bigfoot-type creature which attacked the family in their home in Falk, Arkansas in 1971. I wonder how many more stories there are like this. The local Native Americans also have legends and stories of Bigfoot Sasquatch type beings as well. Long before the legend of Boggy Creek was even a movie, the Caddo referred to these creatures as Hayakathis, meaning giant. From Kathy Mossowitz Strain's book, Giants, Cannibals, and Monsters, are some Caddo stories which give us more details about the hidden identity and possible behavior of this giant. They refer to as Hayakathi. Some of the details in the book which relate to this giant also refer to as cannibals or a taking of hunters who never seem to return, one after the other while having looked for the previous hunter who had also gone missing. Those who run away together from the giant in the same party who are later captured one after the other, which the giant is always able to catch up to after having taken the time to store the previous individual which it had also gathered. There is even an indication in one of the stories of the giant using a tree with a hole it has dug underneath it as a cave-like den, where it is then able to store human bodies. There is even a story which relates to what the book describes as another kind of cannibal. These other cannibals are described as grave robbers, which will take a man's body from a grave before the spirits can take him away. As the book relates, indicating that the dead which had been taken from their graves may very well have been a food source for this differently described variant of a cannibal monster. On to the next one. One enduring cryptozoological mystery is why Bigfoot sometimes fail to leave tracks where they clearly should. With weight often estimated upward of 500 pounds, these creatures should leave tracks in all but the hardest media, yet many do not. In 1962 in Ohio, a couple parked near Big Indian Creek to see a large figure walk through a barbed wire fence and approach the car. The creature is a seven-foot-tall, tan-colored Bigfoot with fangs and claws, albeit sickly or dead-looking. Snapping out of their daze, the couple rolls up their window and drives away, but not before the beast crouches in front of the car, hops up, and disappears. They return the next day but find zero evidence of the event, including footprints. 
1969 in Alberta, Guy LaRuth and Hurley Peterson are building a pump house foundation by the North Saskatchewan River when Peterson spies a tall, dark figure standing on top of a 300-foot-high bank about half a mile away and watching them. Both witnesses observe the figure for half an hour. When they finally investigate the area, they estimate the being's height at around 15 feet, but find no footprints. In 1975, in Utah, a couple in their mountain cabin 70 miles outside Cedar City noticed a variety of strange noises, including a motor running every night. Early one morning, the husband hears heavy footsteps approaching the cabin accompanied by a huge, dark form moving outside the window. The witness opens the cabin door slowly, but sees no one outside and hears nothing retreating. What puzzles me is there were no footprints of any kind, and we have lots of snow here. He later told Alan Barry, My First Nation friend tells me it's the Newput, meaning ghost in their language, and only a few will dare stay in the area overnight. In 1975, in Kentucky, during the Spotsville Monster sightings, a neighbor visits the Nunnelly family and tells them he encountered an eight-foot-tall Bigfoot the previous summer. He fired his rifle 16 times at the creature through his screen door. It just walked off without making a sound, he tells them. The neighbor found neither blood nor footprint, not even a single footprint, and it had to weigh at least four or five hundred pounds. Perhaps the most famous Sasquatch to never leave tracks is the large hairy hominoid that stalked a home in Rochdale, Indiana. Beginning in August 1972, Lou Rogers and her son Keith started hearing odd vocalizations on their property, beginning as animalistic growls and hoots before shifting to more human sounds. Whatever had made the noises seemed now to be breathing down her neck, wrote Jerome Clark of one early incident. She turned around slowly, but could see nothing. Thoroughly shaken, she and Keith fled into the house. Unbeknownst to Lou, her brother had observed a luminous object land in a nearby cornfield 90 minutes earlier, before disappearing in a flash. This cornfield would serve as ground zero for the Rochdale Bigfoot. The Rogers home soon came under assault from slaps and taps on the sidings and windows. Soon after, the six-foot-tall creature began appearing nightly between 10 and 11.30 p.m. for three weeks. You could feel it coming somehow. It's hard to explain, Rogers said. The feeling would just keep getting stronger and stronger. And then, when it got strongest so you knew something had to happen, the knocking would start. The creature was sometimes seen peering through windows, giving the impression of a broad, bipedal gorilla with intermittently glowing eyes. It never left any physical evidence, however. Rogers said what was weird was that we could never find tracks even when it ran over mud. It would run and jump, but it was like somehow it wasn't touching anything. When it ran through weeds, you couldn't hear anything. And sometimes when you looked at it, it looked like you could see through it. The only footprints ever discovered were tiny three-inch tracks of a foot and a stub. Other Rochdale residents began seeing the creature and the strange activity started ramping up. Lou found a plastic flying saucer toy in her home, which did not belong to Keith. The creature shrugged off shotgun blast. Animal pens and gardens were raided. An officer told Jerome Clark he believed tracks were never found because the ground was hard and the vegetation was high. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below. 
where you'll find the email at storiesubmission at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye! On to the next one. This encounter is from Pike County in Kentucky. I had just gotten in from raccoon hunting close to my home with a buddy of mine. I'm going to try to relate this evening's event to everyone. We turned our dogs loose, all but one. We had four females, all of them older dogs, none less than four years old. These hounds are what we call finished dogs, meaning they're plenty experienced. The three shot through the country quickly, so after a bit, we drove in their direction. We stopped at a location where my friend has a feeder. We were going to turn his other female loose there and possibly strike a raccoon track. We get out, he gets there, and we walk over to the edge of the timber. She gristles up, he cuts her loose, and she heads straight for the truck and tries to jump in the back, but the tailgate is up. So she crawls under the truck, visibly shaking. He and I both can't believe what she is doing. Because you turn her loose, she is gone with one thing on her mind, finding a raccoon. He mumbled a little and leashed her, led her back over. This time, we walked her over to the feeder. I could not believe what I was seeing. He turned her loose and she about knocked him down, staying up against him. There, on that flat, about 70 feet, were good-sized trees and limbs from 12 to 20 feet long, turned upside down, and leaned and wedged in the fork of standing trees, all in front of the feeder for about 70 feet. Then, at the end of the bench, was a teepee structure. I got this feeling of dread and fear. The dog took off again towards the truck, this dog, I've seen fight raccoons, run a bear. She's not scared of cats. All the while, we didn't hear anything or smell anything, but we'd headed back. I also noticed two pine trees, about 18 inches in diameter, pushed till the roots were exposed. No wind or snow did this. This is sheer strength and force. There are tree snaps abundant there, about the 8 to 9 foot range. We get into the truck. The dog is lying under the truck again. We are both starting to feel a little tense now. We load her up, start to get in the truck, then whoosh pow, a tree falls, pushed or something, about 50 yards back where we just were. We didn't have a phone and we didn't get any pictures, but we're debating whether to go back during the day to get pictures. But I don't know. Whatever it was doesn't want us there. Before I forget, the feeder is a tire nailed to a tree. It was filled with rock instead of feed. It was all gone. The feed was all gone and replaced with rocks. Follow-up report. We went back to the area in daylight and found some partial tracks near a mud puddle. On to the next one. In Sierra County, California, I was on a group father and son fishing trip at Stampede Lake. All the adults were asleep in one tent and all the sons were split up into two more. I was laying awake, I couldn't sleep, listening to everyone else snore. Suddenly, the tent flap was open and about a five foot tall person was standing there looking in. I grabbed my flashlight and shined it into its face. It was a hairy being with not much hair on its black face. We both screamed and woke everybody up. It dropped the tent flap and ran. 
we heard sounds down by the lake that I still have never heard in 35 plus or more years as an outdoorsman. I cannot call the sound horse-like per se, but that would be the closest thing I could describe it to. Everyone woke up startled and got mad at me thinking I was making it up. I was told I was nuts, crazy, lying, and just about everything else under the sun. Even my own father ridiculed me. I remember vividly the look of surprise on its face. When it screamed with me, I remember seeing its eyes go wide and the white showing as well as the flashlight beam reflecting off a row of perfectly straight teeth in the front. I really cannot say I saw canine teeth, just straight, flat, whitish teeth and gums. The next morning, we walked down to Stampede Lake to fish, and there were two sets of larger tracks that the tracks of the small one seemed to join up with. I was so shamed into being quiet for this for so long, I have told very few people since. I am damn sure I saw a juvenile Bigfoot open my tent, scream, and run off towards his parents' calls for him. On to the next one. I bass fished all the time. One morning I was fishing on the northwest end on Lake Chodard and I heard a muffled crash back in the willows. I looked up immediately and saw this large black or dark creature much taller than a grown man hurrying away from me with his head turned looking at me. This has been a long time now and I never told anyone what I saw until much later. What I saw is firmly indelible in my head. The sighting was, to the best of my memory, about mid-morning on a calm early summer morning, no wind, and I was fishing alone as I commonly did. I hunt and fish a lot, so I have a pretty good idea the size of things in the woods. I would say the thing was seven feet tall or more. It was about 80 to 100 yards from me. There was no smell other than the smell of willows blooming in the swamp, but one thing stood out. It had a big head. It must have stepped on a limb that snapped, causing me to look up, but that was the only sound it made. It's pretty wet back in the swamp. On to the next one. In Becker County in Minnesota, a hunter was sitting in his pickup truck on a hill at about 6 a.m. waiting for deer. He heard something moving through the woods about a hundred feet away and saw three stooped, two-legged dark figures with round heads walking in a crouched position as if to be stealthy. The witness thought they were keeping low to avoid being seen by another hunter who was in the nearby trees. One creature was smaller than the other two. They walked close together, side by side, with the smaller one in the middle. The trio crossed a grassy field and disappeared into the woods on the other side. On to the next one. In St. Louis County in Minnesota, I was coming home from a sports event and I was going down the road and I looked off to the right of the car and I saw a creature running that was at least seven or nine feet tall. It had very shaggy-like hair. At first, I thought that I was seeing things. There was a very bad stench in the air. It was a smell that I couldn't even describe to you. It was running parallel to the side of the car for a few seconds. Then it veered off into the woods. There was no way that it could have been anything else. I have never seen anything like it before. I stopped the car to see if I could see it again. I looked into the woods and it was a human-like creature with long, shaggy hair that was abnormally tall. It is so hard to describe, to put into words. I went home and told my parents what I had seen and to this day they don't believe me. But my husband does. This area was in the country. There was a field nearby the trees. It is very swampy. And there was a lake not even a half mile away. We called the lake Leaf Lake. 
on to the next one. This report comes from Ohio. My friend and I were trying to get in some exercise and sightseeing between rainstorms in June. We stopped at the Mount Lafayette viewing area and went on a couple of the trails. The last trail we tried was a bike trail and it dropped steeply. We did not go far as it was slippery in the rain and we did not want to risk the climb back up. I saw three black bodies off to the left but couldn't really make them out. I took three pictures of the area and they were really dark. At the time, I couldn't tell what I was looking at, but I knew something was moving a little. I got nervous that we may have stumbled across some black bears and we decided to leave before anything happened. When I got home, I put the pictures on my computer and played around with the setting and I nearly had a heart attack. They looked like a family of giant gorillas. It's fascinating to see what was watching us, but creepy too. On to the next one. This happened in Morgan County, Indiana. I went to stay the weekend with my best friend Sam at his dad's and grandpa's. His dad lived at the top of the hill and there was a pond behind the trailer. His grandpa lived down at the bottom of the hill. His grandpa used to tell us a story about how he went hiking with his pet dog. One day, he was attacked from behind by a large, hairy creature, and the dog attacked the creature and ran it off. He had scars on his back from the attack that resembled scratches made by a much larger hand. Well, me and Sam were fishing in the pond. We were catching bass and bluegill. Fishing was mine and Sam's world. Well, he thought it would be funny to run to the trailer and lock me out. I was at the back door with my back facing the pond trying to get in. It was all fun and play. Well, I heard a sound behind me. The pond was only 20 yards from the back door and was only as big as a small swimming pool. When I heard a sound like someone walking, I turned around and saw a creature. It was covered in hair and stood between seven and eight feet tall. It was walking the path behind the pond between the pond and the woods. It stopped and looked at me. I immediately started screaming and crying, beating on the door and begging Sam to let me in. I turned back around to see where it was and it was gone. But I could hear something heavy moving very fast through the woods away from me. Sam unlocked the door asking me what was wrong and why I was so upset and scared. I told him what I saw. He said he believed it because he had seen and heard weird things around there ever since he can remember. Since then, I have been a very big believer in Bigfoot. On to the next one. Margaret Mayer was driving on Route 203 near the Winding Brook Golf Course near Kinderhook in New York when she saw a strange creature standing on the left side of the road. She noticed the eyes at first and thought that it was a deer as they were almost at ground level. Then it stood up and was then four to five feet taller than when she first saw it. It was not a person, with the eyes being small, but far apart. The Bigfoot looked straight at Margaret a couple of times. The creature only moved from the top part of its shoulders and the head. She did not notice any arms, and she could see the top of the legs, which were really skinny, and it looked deformed, yet it moved fast and did not seem to walk across the road, but moved across it like it was almost gliding. The eyes were yellow, and the head went straight into the shoulders, and there was also no neck. On to the next one. Martha Hellenbeck 
saw round, white eyes that were seven and a half feet off the ground near her back porch at night. She describes them as bright white. On to the next one. A woman found large footprints in the snow near her 4th Avenue home in Whitehall. The tracks were bipedal and appeared to originate near the tree line and circled her house. On to the next one. Susan Helen Beck, a teacher at Ichabod Crane Middle School, was walking in the woods near Cushing's Hill when she heard strange vocalizations that sounded like the sounds of gorillas from the movie Gorillas in the Mist. On to the next one. In Whitehall in Washington County in New York, the witness encountered huge footprints in the wood about 20 inches long and found some tree branches broken down. Walking back to the house, they felt like they were being watched. The next morning, one of the witnesses woke up to see a huge 10-foot-tall creature standing about 20 feet from the house. The creature wandered about for a while. It was brown in color and looked very human except for its size and forehead and its hairy appearance. After about five minutes, it walked past the house and up a nearby bank. As it passed the house, it banged on the wall, awakening the other witnesses. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!